Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to today's event with Vitality. My name is Jamie and I am part of the coaching team at Vitality. Um, and firstly, thanks so much for choosing to spend your afternoon with us today. Um, for those watching, you may be aware, but you may not be aware that I think I am probably one of the keenest runners slash endurance athletes you might ever meet. So if you're anything like me in any way, I think you're in for a real treat over the next hour or so. Um, so the theme for our conversation today, something which I would say is common between runners, cyclists, triathletes, or actually any kind of endurance athlete, is the understanding of how important fueling and training your gut is. Obviously, though, nutrition is essential for other things like managing weight and fueling our everyday activities. But when it comes to exercise, the requirements are very different and therefore the foods that you eat look very different. Um, it may be a well-known fact as well that many people here have also potentially experienced that gut distress is the number one cause of DNF outcomes in endurance sporting events. So did not finish and you don't really want to know exactly why that is, but it's not a good statistic to be part of. Um, so before I introduce our guests today, I must just do a real quick bit of housekeeping. So if everyone watching, we have considered your pre-registered questions and we've incorporated these throughout the session, but we're also going to dedicate some time at the end for some Q&A. So if you do have any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to have answered live, then please do navigate to the right hand sides of your screens and within there you'll find a questions box. And Juliet is behind the scenes where she'll be responding and passing these on to our hosts and onto me. Um, so make sure you get everything into there and we'll see it all, I promise. Um, and if you also check out our handout section in that same panel, you'll find our full lineup for Mental Health Awareness Week in May. So please do download that, share it far and wide. Our events are open to all and everyone is welcome. So that's enough of the bordering part from me. Um, I'm now going to introduce our two guests. And we are really privileged actually today to be joined by two people who I don't think could be better placed to advise us on this topic. Um, firstly, we have James Hudson, who is one of our elite group of Vitality Performance Champions. James is a former professional rugby player and now performance nutritionist and sports scientist at Gloucester Rugby. And we also have another James to join James, uh, which is James Moran. And James is a performance nutritionist and registered dietitian who's had over 10 years experience. Um, James's resume is super impressive. He's worked more recently with the INEOS Grenadiers cycling team, um, British cycling, the English Institute of Sport at the Tour de France, and athletes at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. So I think the best thing for me to do at this point is to hand over to those two um, and I might jump back in at the end and see everyone on the other side. Thank you Jamie for that introduction and good afternoon everybody and thank you again ever so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm really really fortunate to be able to introduce you as Jamie just has done to James Moran who is a real expert in this area of nutrition and has first-hand experience of dealing. In fact, last week, James was, I was discussing from the content person, James was sending me pictures whilst he was up a beautiful mountain in the, in the Alps, whilst working with his team at the, currently in the Uno X pro cycling team. So James, how are you, mate? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, glad to be back in Manchester <laughs> after a <laughs> week at the Tour of the Alps. Not as scenic, but yeah, all good. <laughs> good week, though. Good, some good successes on, on the races that you were there with. Yeah, no, it's good. It's been a busy period. Um, lots of races all over Europe in the spring. So, yeah, good good to be at home now for five weeks. And then <clears throat> races move to southern southern Europe for the next phase of the season. So different challenges. But, yeah, so far, so good. Fantastic. So different challenges when you're in race mode. But I suppose what we want to try and do today is really try and empower those who have joined us. We want to give you the confidence with your strategies around your event. You've probably got the calendar up somewhere at home with a big cross, a big circle around a date where you're going to go and complete a really big challenge or event, or there might be several big crosses or circles on dates across this summer and autumn. And what we want to try and do today is just really explain, go back to a bit of basics and explain really the science behind endurance and how we fuel endurance training and competition, but then also try and help you to understand how to practice these strategies to make the most of your performance when it comes to event time. So 
what we'll do is I think you know, James and I are both at heart geeks and we like to talk a little bit of science and I think actually to help empower you and help you to understand the real basis of it we'll start with a little bit of science so if we could Jamie pop, pop up the, uh, the couple of slides that we've got for us if James if we just start off with talking about this real background based science of what endurance is and what is our body going through when we start to exercise and we start to do some endurance exercise yeah so endurance exercise is commonly defined as anything being over 60 minutes of kind of continual steady state exercise so that can that can vary quite a lot but what we mean from like a fuel point of view is that our body's muscles are using fat and carbohydrate for energy um, and some people think of this as a kind of on off switch so people are either using fat or carbohydrate but the reality is the muscle is using a mixture of fat and carbohydrate at all different intensities as we can see on that graph there and the kind of harder the intensity the, the, the more the body will rely on carbohydrate for fuel and the lower intensity we will use more fat for fuel and this this is essentially what what we mean by by fuel and the thing we need to remember is that even the kind of leanest of athletes someone like Mo Farah or Chris Froome probably has enough stored fat to fuel you know five marathons back to back but they couldn't do it at any intensity whereas carbohydrate we only have a really limited storage um, to probably fuel 90 minutes of intense exercise so when we talk about fueling in this context it's about making sure we've got enough carbohydrate to perform at a high exercise intensity for, for a long period of time. So we just put that into a bit of context as well when we talk about intensity, because a lot of people who are on listening to us now today will also have a bit of understanding of talking about maybe different zones of where their heart rate might be sat. What would we what would we be the best way of describing that in terms of intensity? So when we talk about sort of zone two, we talk about that zone where you can still have just about have a conversation. Where do you where would you kind of point to that when you're talking to your cyclist and you're talking about the intensity of different sessions? How would you relate that with them? Yeah, so like a zone two kind of session, yeah, would be somewhere between that 55, 60% of, of maximal. Um, but the point to remember is even at intensities like that, because of the duration, the body will still be burning through quite a lot of carbohydrate over, over the duration and time. Um, as we ramp up more to kind of um, zone three and above, then that's when it tends to be more carbohydrate dominant. Um, and then when we're doing kind of all out maximal efforts, then it's pretty much 100% carbohydrate dominant. Brilliant. I think that's a really, really key point for everyone to take home straight away is that those intensities, it's not an on off switch. It is a gradual increase where carbohydrate quickly becomes the dominant fuel source in terms of what we need. So even when we're doing those, you know, say 10K, you know, we've got the Vitality 10K coming up in the first weekend of May. People might, out there might be doing that as one of their first events of the year. If you're completing that in that 60 to 90 minute plus time, you're going to be using a predominantly carbohydrate source and you're going to need to prepare for that event in that way. So, Jamie, if you just pop on the next slide, please. Um, and that's what we're talking about as well, isn't it? We've only got a certain capacity to store carbohydrate. It's not this bottomless pit. Um, uh, whereas, like you mentioned, fat storage in our bodies, even the leanest of athletes has got enough energy stored in their body fat to last several marathons. So when we talk about being able to store carbohydrate, just give us an idea of, of how we do that and, and where in the body we do that. Yeah, so the, the biggest storage is, is within the muscle, as we can see there on, on the graph. Um, depending on how much muscle mass you have and training status, like elite athletes can commonly store more um, carbohydrate as glycogen in the muscle, but around 400 grams of stored carbohydrate. And then the liver acts as a bit of a kind of uh, sink um, that, that keeps glucose in, the, in there to make sure that there is enough in the blood, mostly for the brain and for the vital organs. Um, and they're the, they're the kind of main main storage parts. I mean, when we're exercising, we're not just fueling the muscle to move us. Some is needed for the brain, for, for the kidneys, you know, for all of the other functions in the body. And if anybody's experienced under fueling or bonking, as it's called in, in cycling communities, you know, that, that fuzzy feeling of, of feeling lightheaded. And that's purely because the muscle is taking up so much glucose from the blood. The amount going to the brain is, is is dipping below what the brain likes, which is what, what we want to avoid at all costs, really. 
<laughs> exactly. I think that hopefully that's already started to answer some of the questions that we had. And we had one specific question talking about that, that point of dizziness or feeling quite weak on the bike or while they're running. So again, hopefully that's given you guys a bit more of an understanding about how that how that does uh, that carbohydrate is stored in the muscle. You know, I often refer to it with the, the athletes I work with is like a fuel tank. There's only so much space in that fuel tank for carbohydrate and it's how we manage that and how we manage that during events as well. So if we go on to the next quick slide there, we can have a little talk about how that changes when we actually do feed some carbohydrate while we're doing a training session or an event when it gets into that longer endurance model. So this, this work, which was done by Mark Fell and was published last year, is a really nice study showing that. So James, do you want to expand on how that might affect when we actually do feed some carbohydrate during our training and during an event? Yeah, and this, this was a study. So I was one of the researchers on this study and one of the, the unlucky participants. So what we, what we actually had to do was um, carbohydrate load the day before so as if we were doing an event and then we had to sit on the bike for three hours in a lab at kind of a, a zone zone two intensity so not not really hard like a, a steady state but for, for three hours so at the time I think I was pedaling for 200 watts for three hours and we either didn't eat or we either ate 45 grams an hour or we ate 90 grams an hour and the, the first graph shows that the you know, when we didn't eat, our blood glucose fell throughout the three hours. Uh, when we had 45 grams, we were, it, it was kind of maintained. And in the 90 grams per hour, it was maintained a little bit more. So that just meant there was more available to be used by the muscle for fuel. Um, and then the other graph just shows that we were able to burn more carbohydrate through that period. And then at the end of the three hours, we had to do a kind of all out test to exhaustion. So to pedal at 350 watts until till you couldn't pedal anymore. And if you flip onto the next slide, we 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 found a really big difference in in between the groups. The group that consumed 90 grams per hour could go for almost three times as long as the the guys that hadn't eaten anything over the three hours. Um, so it was quite quite nice to actually show this. And this was to replicate what we commonly do in cycling, where a race will be fairly low intensity for big parts and then it will often finish in a sprint or a hill climb in the end so meaning that the guys that have fueled better throughout that three hours are able to perform at the end of um, yeah for the final sprint or for the final climb brilliant i'm glad i didn't get asked to uh, participate in that one i'm not sure <laughs> i'm not sure i'm not sure my bum could take three hours sat in a saddle <laughs> we, we had to have muscle biopsies as well but yeah that's a that's a different story <laughs> yeah that is it yeah i've had one of those done but i'm not <laughs> we, we won't share stories of that right now but again it's a really nice bit of research because it shows us that when we do feed some carbohydrate while we're doing that endurance event not only does the body more efficiently use that fuel whilst we're doing the exercise, but then also our ability to maintain our blood sugar levels throughout the exercise are maintained in a way which means that not only is our muscle working, but our brain and our, our perception of what's going on, our decision making and our ability then at the end of the event to actually still maintain a high intensity is really crucial. So as much as people out there might not be having a sprint finish to their event, it's still really key to demonstrate that actually by doing that throughout the time, we're going to be able to perform more effectively throughout the entire race rather than not enjoying that last hour potentially of, of really hanging on. So it's a really nice way of showing that. And yeah, and just finishing the event on your hands and knees and being absolutely exhausted. And then, for, you know, for most of us who don't have the luxury of, of getting on a team bus and having a massage and food prepared, just actually being more human after you finished your event and being able to enjoy some food and drinks yeah. and not being a zombie the next day. So in a yeah. practical real world sitting. Yeah, so now, and we'll get on to talking a little bit about what form and what shape some of these foods might take. But obviously one of the common things that a lot of athletes will use, and for reasons which we'll go into, will be things like carbohydrate drinks and gels. So just so we start to put things into context in the applied world, 90 grams of carbohydrate an hour, we're looking at probably, you tell me now, probably around about three of the of the usual gel portions per hour. Something like that would be about right, wouldn't it? Yeah, three to four, depending depending on the size. So, yeah, like a, a gel every 15 minutes or a few, 150 mils of a, of a carb drink, yeah, depending on what, what you use. 
year. So already, and again, this isn't necessarily directly then translatable into the people that are listening at home, but just to understand that actually that is the sort of level that we're, we're talking about. And that's actually fairly moderate, isn't it? I mean, I think when we were talking about some of the cyclists you were working with last week, you've got guys up to sort of 120 plus grams of carbohydrate an hour across the whole stage of an event. Yeah, exactly. But these guys are able to perform at a higher relative intensity so they are performing at a higher intensity they're burning through more carbohydrate at that intensity so 120 grams an hour is, is very extreme and probably yeah only for the the elite uh, yeah. athletes um, and cyclists as well we tend to find fewer gut issues with absorbing high amounts of carbohydrate with cyclists compared to runners or triathletes because the body's in a more stable position whereas with the running we do get a lot of movement of the gut and then you know you can have have more likely to have uh, detrimental effects if we if we try and push the carbs too high yeah so for people at home who are listening if they're if, you know they're going to be doing an event which is going to take them maybe two to three hours as a start point where do you think would be a start point for them to start looking at how they how they adapt this science into their own event fueling and training yeah i mean the the kind of ideal um fueling during an event like that would be somewhere in the region of 60 to 90 grams per hour from from the literature and things like that but how an individual would get there is the important thing if you just decided on a race day to try and eat three or four gels per hour you you, you would yeah and nine <laughs> times out of ten you would probably have a really bad stomach and a bad experience so it's about working back maybe 10 12 weeks before the event and and trying to work up to to those kind of amounts in either on the run or on the bike and finding yeah where the individual tolerance is because some people might not be able to get to 90 grams some might be able to get to 60 grams or 50 grams so it's about starting small and finding where the the, the tolerance is and then trying to almost train train the gut which we can speak about a bit more yeah perfect a perfect segue into into that idea of not only are we going to be training our muscles when we're going out and training each weekend or, or each weeknight, you know, we're doing these long runs, which tend to be at the weekend and a lot of people's schedules. We need to start training our gut to be able to actually absorb this carbohydrate as well. So when we talk about training the gut, what are the key things that really, from a science point of view, are we going to consider? Yeah, I mean, the first thing to think about in, in endurance, and this can be made worse by the heat or by intensity or just by general stress, um, we can often see a change in blood flow to the digestive system. It's, it's diverted to the working muscles. So this can in itself cause, cause gut issues. And the second thing that, that often people don't practice is, is the mechanism of, of getting some food from the pocket and eating it or drinking it while they're on the move, because this is a skill that takes practice as well. But the main kind of things that are happening internally is that stomach emptying can become slowed slowed down. So if we're putting lots of food in, the stomach starts to slow down and it can almost back up like a like a traffic jam in the stomach. And then the second thing that can happen in the small intestine is that um, we can only absorb around 60 grams of glucose containing carbohydrate per hour. So if we if we go over over that, then things will either back up one way or, or back up the other, and we will get kind of gastrointestinal issues. So that this is where kind of training the gut and practicing strategies is is really key. I always say to the riders that I work with, you wouldn't go out and start smashing yourself doing kind of threshold sessions and and then not expecting that that you would kind of recover and perform and it's the same with the gut we need to train the gut to be able to tolerate these conditions perfect so when we talk about that where it's i think the crucial thing there as well as it's glucose is saturated at that sort of 60 grams an hour mark so when we talk about then what types of food choices we can make or what types of gels or sports food products we could use if jamie if we just get onto the next slide we talk about the ability then for multiple forms of sugars to be able to be used by the gut throughout the exercise session so how might that look as well and why why is that important if we are doing something which is lasting a long long time you know two three hours plus uh, we're out on the bike or we're out doing a trail run for several hours that might be 25 30 plus kilometers or a multiple day event we might be looking for to get more carbohydrate in than that so how could we do that with, with something with different types of sugars and why would that work yeah the key is that if if we're just using kind of glucose based drinks and gels 
then we only have kind of one door that can get through the intestine and, and, and into the blood. And that gets kind of blocked at kind of six, around 60 grams per hour, we think. So if somebody who's having a, a glucose or maltodextrin-based drink or gel and they exceeded that, then we would it would back up and we would probably get nausea or vomiting or, or diarrhea. If we add a, a different type of sugar called fructose, um, that opens a, a different door in the small intestine. So we can then actually get more sugars through and into the blood into the muscle and fructose kind of gets a, a bad rep because of high fructose corn syrup so these aren't the kind of drinks and foods to be sat at home watching and it is slightly different to high fructose corn syrup um, so they're just to be used kind of in during exercise um, and the body will utilize them so they're not kind of harmful um, but yeah just something to mention yeah definitely i think you're absolutely spot on is that you know you, we start to mention sugar we start to mention fructose and suddenly people go oh that's not healthy that's not good for us and i think sometimes it gets a little bit misconstrued is that actually sometimes the food choices that we make when we're doing endurance exercise or that might promote performance might not always be the healthiest choices and actually for the purpose of actually doing some of these events as, as we'll get onto with some of the food choices we have to be thoughtful about that and actually it's not always the standard rule book around healthy choices versus unhealthy it's always a matter of what is the purpose how can we fuel that work most effectively and keep our gut nice and comfortable during that time yeah definitely and i think endurance exercise by by itself and especially with the guys i work with you could probably argue that's that's not particularly healthy so yeah you know it, it's it's about giving your body the tools it needs for the purpose at, at that time um but yeah just having a bit of thought around strategies before race day um is the key yeah so we just pop onto the last slide and we'll just talk through then just to, just to sum up so obviously things to think about around that that two-way street if we like to prevent those traffic jams just the take-home messages for the people at people at home what are the things that we should just think about there yeah so we really want to be trying early so not not leaving it to a week before or you know talking 10 12 weeks earlier and start to get used to taking on board fuel in in sessions working out how much you're actually consuming seeing if there's any side effects seeing why trying different products but bit by bit finding out what what works for you and there's different ways of training the stomach to to empty better one way can be kind of to have quite a large pre-training carbohydrate meal and this can kind of help to to stretch the stomach and get used to uh exercising with food in the stomach um and training but the, the one we would use the most would be to train with high carbohydrate intake during exercise so at the moment if you're not taking on board anything in your long sessions then maybe just starting with one gel or one bar per hour and then next week increasing that to one and a half or two and just increasing it gradually um, another thing can be people if they're not eating much carbohydrate in the diet then this can reduce the amount of transporters that are in the intestine so on this slide before we showed those transporters that take the carbohydrate into the blood if you're following a really low carbohydrate diet then you have less of these transporters so then if you try and eat a lot of carbohydrate around around a race or a, a race the day before a race then the, the gut won't like it it hasn't got the equipment to, to get it through and then another solution can be um, to to use a probiotic, um, whether that's a yogurt drink or a capsule, because there's some some studies that show that this can help to pull the carbohydrate through um, to be used by the muscle. So there's a few few things from a physiological standpoint, but the the most important thing is to just start practicing um, a long time out and then build, you know, build a little almost like a like you would with a training diary in training peaks or whatever platform you use for recording your training make a note of what you've had to eat how it went if you had any symptoms and and, and build build this bank of knowledge i think that's a brilliant point and actually comes back to one of the questions which somebody registered before the session which was around that idea of how do you actually kind of monitor any stomach issues and things like that and i think that's a brilliant answer to that question is try and keep that diary of what session did i do what what food choices did i make before that session what did what food choices did i then make whilst i was on the bike or on the run and what symptoms did i get from that because i think one of the key things that we talk about going back to that element of food for a purpose and actually fueling purposely for those sessions is that debate around healthy non-healthy choices but actually 
the amount of fiber in some of those choices that we might make, especially at breakfast. So say we're going out for our long run on a Sunday morning and we're getting up and we're in really good habits. So we're having a nice high carbohydrate meal before we go out. Actually, when you have gastrointestinal discomfort, it might be that we're not just making, we're in great habits in terms of getting up and having that meal, but then what choices we're making at that meal time might also not be helping with any distress that we get. So in a classic one, big bowl of porridge on the morning is a great healthy choice, but it's also packed with fiber. So again, James, if you explain why that fiber might then change and, and, and add to that gut, gut discomfort and how you might remedy that. Yeah, so fat fiber is really good. It's you know it's it's good for helping regulate blood glucose. It's it can be useful for helping with weight management, for reducing bowel cancer. You know, there's so many benefits to fiber. But in an acute setting, especially around a hard session or <clears throat> around nerves, that fiber it it can cost energy to digest it and process it, and it can sit quite heavy in the gut. So for some people, they can have porridge as a breakfast year round, they have no no problems. But if somebody's prone to gut um, symptoms, then that's one of the things I'd be thinking, okay, maybe we could have a lower fiber alternative just for this day. So cereals we commonly use with, with some of the bike riders might be like Rice Krispies or rice what white rice but we would have a little bit of porridge in there so instead of having you know the full portion of, of porridge we would maybe have a small amount and then supplement the carbs with with rice um use smoothies uh pancakes so things that are just a bit lighter and easier to digest because the amount of water that and um, our liquid that you need for making porridge it, it's just a lot of weight as well you know you're talking about five six hundred grams of food weight compared to 250, 300 grams if you're using a, a lower fiber option that, do, that doesn't bind as much weight. So it's about looking at all of these things. Um, yeah. And the, the, other, the other things we would look at as well would be fat and protein because these are two of the most, they, they take a lot of energy to digest and they can sit quite heavy in the stomach. So especially before a race, you know, it's probably not the meal where we need to be too concerned about having eggs or having a you know a lot of yogurt if we're concerned about, about stomach issues so it's just about giving the body the tools it needs for that task but yeah. not kind of just eating the same every day um that's yeah. yeah that's brilliant i think that's absolutely true because obviously like you said the, the fat content of those meals might slow down the digestion of, of those carbohydrate foods and might, might put the gut under a bit more stress and actually you know have to, having that understanding and like we said at the start of the session having the confidence to make those choices based on how you feel you know all the time we, you know, we will both have it no matter what sport you work in i want to feel light i want to feel kind of bouncy when i'm running i want to feel light on the bike and that is often around that that meal choice making sure it's not too heavy so exactly like you said having something which is high in carbohydrate not particularly high in fat or protein at that time pre big uh, pre-race or pre-long run or cycle on the weekends when we're working towards these strategies means it gives us confidence so having a bowl of rice krispies or some flaked rice mixed with your porridge is all really good ideas and things and that's precisely why we're talking about practice aren't we because like you mentioned at the start 10 to 12 weeks out from the big event let's start to build these things into our normal routine to make sure that we feel good when we're actually practicing it gives us that confidence when it comes to to uh, to the actual event so I suppose the other thing we did mention earlier on is actually the mechanics of eating and drinking. So whether you're on the bike, whether you're running, I mean, I think we've both probably at different times worked with swimmers as well, who potentially if they're doing long distance swims, you know, they've got to roll on their back and try, try and try and eat or get some food and liquid in. So again, how do you work on that in terms of mechanics and, and with the events that these, these guys might be involved in? Yeah, I think um, if you have a plan for where in your session you're going to take on fuel, <clears throat> so commonly athletes will, when they're new to fueling, they won't take anything on board until they start to feel fatigued and it's kind of a bit too late then. So what I would say is if you, if you have a watch or a computer on your bike, some of the guys I work with set a reminder to, to fuel so it, it comes up as a prompt. So you're getting in the habit of taking on board fuel every... 8k or 20k or 20 minutes and then kind of yeah then physically you know the practice of while in motion getting the thing out of your back pocket you know opening it chewing it without losing losing a stride or you know falling off your bike it does take practice and i think you, you'll be in a much better state if you can yeah start practicing that find what what products actually work well from a not just the stomach point of view but 
opening them and if you can put them in a, in a different uh, container so they're easier to get down that can be another option as well yeah i think as well there's always this temptation with guys when you get out to these events it might be sponsored by certain certain ambassadors or by certain brands and there's always a temptation to say oh well i've been practicing all you know the last 12 weeks with this particular brand of drink and gel but because the event's sponsored by this i'll come in i'll just use the ones that are there and that's a real for me that's always a big red flag is practice 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 but it doesn't deviate from that when it comes to race day exactly i mean we, we actually in the race last week we had one of our riders who got dropped from the peloton and the cars had left him and he was kind of right at the back and he'd run out of fuel in the, on this particular stage because we had a rider up the front so he was then thinking because it's quite common you would then borrow a drink or a gel from another team so even though he was fatigued and tired he was trying to think which other teams use the same brand that we do and he constantly messaged me afterwards he said i'll pick this team because i know they have the same gel as us so he was he, he was thinking like that but yeah make sure that you're self-sufficient that you've got the foods you know that you rely on it's almost like you wouldn't turn up to an event and just borrow someone else's bike shoes or trainers or bike you know you, you would have your own kit you probably plan weeks in advance what what shorts you're going to wear what under vest you know all those kind of things so nutrition should be just the same yeah. in my opinion yeah completely i think the, the less chance you can you can put it to the more confidence you've got when you're doing the event as well so obviously we've talked quite a lot around um sports drinks and gels because let's face it they are the predominant source because of the ease of mechanics of getting them into your body but also they generally are, are palatable some people find them a little bit sweet but i think me personally you can tell me what you think but when dealing with your everyday athletes like hopefully the guys that are on the call now the biggest fear around gels is often around those gut issues so practice 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 but also for me it's also picking brands or, or ones that, which are isotonic so i think that isotonic balance in terms of the fluid balance in the gut will also have a big effect won't it yeah definitely and and other things like ph you know some <clears throat> some gels and drinks are quite acidic um which can aggravate some people um flavors yeah so just kind of find yeah maybe speak to speak to friends or people the people you're training with find which ones have worked for them and, and just use yeah try and find the right one that works for you and um, so there's brands now that are unflavored or neutral so that they don't have that sickly sickly taste because texture as well is another thing some people just don't don't like the texture of certain brands so yeah, yeah there's a lot of brands out there but the, the it's i wouldn't base it on which one's the cheapest <laughs> trying to kind of you know use a re reputable brand and you know ask, ask around and, and do your research really but ph and isotonic can can definitely help and find a flavor that you like yeah and if we've got people out there who actually say you know what I, i'm not going to use as many gels or, or, or sports drinks and what i'm actually going to do is i'm going to have whole foods if, if again mechanically they can cope with that what are the things that you might put in the riders feedback uh, that might be suitable that they can actually manage to eat in terms of whole foods while they're on the bike say for a stage yeah i think the the longer that you're exercising for obviously the relative intensity then reduces a little bit and so kind of for ultra endurance events and then that opens up the opportunity to take on board more more natural or whole foods whereas the kind of shorter a marathon you know which is high intensity if you're trying to fuel that off bananas and solid foods you would be more likely to get get stomach upsets but for the longer stuff yeah again using combinations of textures but we would use semi-solid rice cakes so they're almost like a, a block of of rice pudding which we would use different different flavors in which are really easy to make small kind of bread rolls with jam and honey uh nutella is quite a common one and then um, when i was working with um kevin sinfield last year when he did a 24-hour challenge we just recognized you you can't just eat sickly sweet things for 24 hours so we, <laughs> we, we on that challenge we use kind of slices of mini pizza um like trail mix with like peanut M&Ms and uh, bits of dried fruit and things like that, as well as the sports nutrition products. So we we, we try to yeah be a bit more varied there, pretzels and yeah. things like that. But again, but again, finding out things that that work for you as an individual, because um, yeah. there, there might be appetite and things can change a lot as well with fatigue. So your appetite 
fresh compared to your appetite 10 hours into a big challenge can be really different and you can crave completely different food so for those ultra endurance events it's quite hard to really practice it because you're never going to do like 24 hours in practice but yeah. just yeah just having a range of textures and and things that you know you can you can get on well with um yeah i think that's so true because i've had friends who've done their first iron man and, and again to do your first iron man as an amateur to complete it is a huge achievement so if there's anyone out there who is taking that on this year i think you know he when i worked with him in terms of his fueling he got to his run and he just wanted something salty he just was craving something salty crunchy rather than than, than smooth or so again exactly like you say practicing and exactly what types of food you might want but also i think when you, you mentioned the work you did with with kevin sinfield there with that 24 hour challenge it's a fantastic uh, event that to be part of but i think that highlights the fact as well for anyone out there who is sat there thinking oh 24 hours he'll mostly be using fat going right back to slide one that we talked about he was still using a huge amount of carbohydrate every hour so he was still getting through somewhere near sort of 79 80 grams of carbohydrate an hour for that whole time yeah yeah that was the target we set there was a couple of hours in the early hours of the morning where appetite and what i found as well just from running for that amount of time you can get quite seasick like motion sickness um so there's a few hours where he dipped around 40 50 grams an hour but the average for the 24 hours was i think 75 grams of carbs per hour which was a challenge yeah. and having a nutritionist on hand to kind of give the food to you but it, it was because i planned kind of 24 hours of, of what we we're aiming for um and he, yeah. he said afterwards if if he hadn't have had that he probably he wouldn't have got through which was yeah, yeah good good to know when i was kind of shoveling gels and <laughs> pretzels and crisps down in, in a lay-by in, in East Midlands somewhere. But yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. But again, I think it just shows, doesn't it, that you know, even if it is what could be perceived as a very long or lower intensity event, we're still getting through a hell of a lot of fuel. So by able to provide it, you know, if it wasn't for other factors, maybe he could keep on going because he's got the fuel in, in, in the body to actually do it. But it's it's also other 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 aspects of just sheer fatigue, you know, cramp and things like that, which might set in at those points as well. Yeah, I mean, it's almost you know, if you're driving your car 80 miles an hour, <clears throat> then it's going to run out of fuel in in a short space of time. If you're driving your car at 30 miles an hour, it's still going to run out of fuel. It's just going to take take longer, but the fuel tank is is going to empty, and that's yeah. You still yeah. would benefit from having having carbohydrate just at a, probably a smaller amount. Brilliant. Now, as just before we get on to answering some of the questions that we had come in as well, just to finish off, one of the big barriers we also get with this, I, I you know, again, we shared some some stories and experiences of working with everyday athletes as well as elite athletes, and. The same similar themes are there in that a lot of people are concerned that by taking on this fuel um, during their longer runs during the week and preparing for their event, their outcome and the reason why they might be taking part in this event might be to try and gain some balance or some weight management over time. So by increasing the amount of exercise they've done, which is a fantastic thing, and to give themselves that target of taking part in an event, be it their first 10K, half marathon or marathon, their, their end outcome goal would be to complete it, but it might also be to lose some body weight over time. And sometimes we can see that as being a really big barrier for somebody. Now, we've talked about this before, before with elite athletes, is the reason why we want to promote this is so they can succeed in their event and do that. But how does that also fit in with weight management for, for some of the people out there as well? Why, why might fueling during their long runs and working towards this event also help promote the end goal of weight loss or weight management? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, really good, good question and a good point, and something I see with with elite athletes as well, <clears throat> because commonly what we'll see is somebody will do a long run or a long ride, they'll they'll underfuel it, thinking, oh, well, I'm going to burn three thousand calories here, so you know that's a big big buffer, then I can eat more the next days. They'll get home absolutely nailed. They'll then raid the cupboards. They'll kind of eat whatever's there and then the next day they'll feel really tired and then they'll probably eat a bit more there and then what we see is over that three days they've actually in an energy surplus so they've got more calories in than what they've burned and the training's been compromised because they've not fueled the training that well um, and then when they come to a session on monday night or tuesday then they're probably not not quite as good and snacking a bit more here and there and then weight actually doesn't change or in some circumstances i've seen athletes weight go up so what we try and do is flip it on its head and say let's really focus on fueling well for these key sessions 
so then you're not needing to recover for three days um because even if you're eating like 100 grams an hour that's 400 calories per hour and most intensity should be burning way way more than that so by taking some carbohydrate in the session you're going to improve the quality but improve how you recover as well and especially like i said before you know i've done it you come home from a hard ride or a run on a sunday then the kid you're with the kids and you're just like a zombie all day and you know it improves your life away from training as well so if, if we're doing the basics right through you know a 10 12 week training block managing energy managing fueling then weight should should come down without kind of really screwing ourselves over and under fueling the sessions yeah brilliant and i think that goes back to as well how and where we fit that in with with athletes throughout the week as well so you guys at home um, when you're talking about being everyday athletes it might be that on that weekend we're working towards that so having a bit more carbohydrate potentially the day before and the evening before the day before that that big run or big ride on a sunday or over the weekend days is going to help prepare that fueling during that session and then and then afterwards but then that means that then the rest of the week can fit together you might not do another really intense or long long uh, practice event during the week and you can fuel that appropriately you won't necessarily need to fuel while you're on the bike or on the run during the sessions in the week because your normal nutrition intake during the week the sessions might not be as long but those weekend rides, those weekend runs that are working towards it, they're where we need to start practicing and working on that. And that's sort of 10, 12 weeks out from an event. So again, trying to dispel those myths that by digging yourself a massive hole <laughs> on those on those sessions at the weekend, that that's also going to help you with that weight management. By planning your week well, we can make sure we're achieving that. So let's just move through a couple more of the questions which we had, which we had before. So thank you to everybody who sent them in before the event. Um, we've talked a lot about non-gel alternatives, so supporting those. So we've talked through, you know, there's all sorts of products around bars and, and beans as well and sports drinks. But even things like you mentioned as well, pretzels, fruit, it's all about the mechanics and whether you can actually cope with that. Um, and then we've also had a little question around protein intake. So whether we should be having any protein intake before, during any of these longer rides or, or runs and workouts as well. So we talked about that morning meal breakfast, not necessarily having to have a large protein portion or a big protein component because of digestion. But then is there any other time during those longer rides that we should consider that? Um, I mean, protein is one of those things, having a protein meal, or not having a protein meal doesn't make any any difference to our bodies. It's kind of what we do over days and weeks and months with protein. Whereas carbohydrate, if you don't eat carbohydrate and you train, you see it in that session. So it can be a good practice to have uh, protein in in recovery and um, to to help with with muscle recovery and repair. But if that's the only protein you have in that day, then it's it's not going to do anything. So it's about making sure we're having you know some some eggs or some yogurt or some chicken or fish or whatever with each, with most meals um, throughout the day and just being consistent with protein. I think too often we'll focus on recovery straight afterwards, but if you've not fueled the session well and you've not had enough protein over the day, then it's kind of pointless really. Yeah, and again, it doesn't have to come from, I think this protein shake mantra, it doesn't have to come from a liquid protein shake. If when you come in after that big run or ride on a Sunday and you struggle to eat, um, then maybe something a smoothie maybe some milk yogurt exactly that that could be a perfect fit in that first opportunity to eat after that and then like you say getting a protein source at the subsequent meals throughout the day to help recovery and throughout the weekday today that's what's going to make the difference but like we've mentioned hopefully throughout this session of hammered away now the priority around these big big pr preparation rides and runs is around your carbohydrate provision um a little bit around we've talked through that um a little bit around a female athlete. So are there any any considerations that we should think about for female athletes out there? Are there any differences in fueling or, or fuel use that we should consider as as as, as change? You've got you've got a, a ladies team at, at Uno X. Um, are there any things that change slightly with how you operate uh, there? Um, yeah, I mean, pound for pound, like a, an active female will have the same energy requirements as, as an active male. Um, and I think the, the big thing is just making sure that they're getting adequate energy um, to support the demands of the sport, demands of occupational stuff. You know, I work with an elite athlete who 
her, her weight started dropping um, after she'd she'd had a baby and we were kind of fueling training and all things like that but it was just actually the running around after after a toddler that that she'd not accounted for in her life before and we actually then had to factor in snacks and, and extra things for when she was at home after training so th those kind of things we often don't don't look at and then with with female athletes in particular we just need to be mindful of making sure that they're getting enough iron getting enough zinc and calcium um, and b vitamins these are commonly the things that um, female athletes can be deficient of and at, at risk of especially with menstrual function and, and bone health but the, the main thing is that female athletes are kind of not afraid of carbohydrate that they're kind of eating enough carbohydrate because there's still a lot of myths around carbohydrates making you fat or causing weight gain whereas carbohydrate is yeah it's really the the key to unlocking your performance yeah absolutely i think that's also probably timely to to bring that point as well as that actually the amounts of carbohydrate that we can burn while we're doing these endurance events are kind of absolute they are they're not dependent necessarily upon on body size and 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 uh, overall muscle mass things like that whereas we might guide athletes and people to eat their total over a day day to day based around their body size and how much energy they need but actually when it comes to doing endurance events it's an absolute amount so when we talk about that kind of 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate each hour you know couple of gels you know a couple of rice cakes these kind of food choices bananas making up 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate these are absolute and are translatable across different groups it's not oh we you know your, your 60 your 65 kilo cyclist versus your, your 50 kilo female cyclist has got a vast difference it's not it's it's very similar across the board while they're actually on the bike or in the event so i think that's something to bear in mind as well is that we can't be afraid of these things basing it on the fact that we might have a smaller frame and, and, and difference between male and females. It's, it's, it's important to understand it will fuel the work you're doing whilst you're out there. Yeah, and if anything, people with a smaller frame are probably at an advantage because they they can absorb the same amount as kind of somebody who's six foot six, but they've kind of um, able to use more of that. So yeah, probably yeah. at an advantage. The other thing to think about is when we're less fit or less trained, our muscles will burn through more carbohydrate at lower intensity. So it's it's worth you know making sure that we're fueling well, even though we might have a weight goal in mind, um, because that that can be something people think. Oh, once I've lost the weight, then I'll start fueling my training. So it's just yeah, re rethinking that a little bit. Brilliant. Right, I might ask Jamie if he wants to come back into the virtual room and see if anyone's got any questions from the floor or from uh, from anyone online who's joined us to see if he's got any questions he can pass on that we can try and answer now on the spot. Is it Definitely. I've got a horrible sheet of scribbles here with all of the engagement. <laughs> so it's been great. And uh, yeah, I've loved all of the things that you said. Um, there's a few things that you mentioned which have actually triggered quite a lot more questions. And one of those was you mentioned about pre and probiotics. So I was wondering firstly, if you could maybe just, I'm gonna put this question out there and then I'll let you decide who who takes what, but uh, like a little bit on what prebiotics are, what probiotics are, and then also any examples of kind of real foods that you'd suggest that can help with both of those things. Yeah, um, yeah. James, you go yeah, ahead, I mean, yeah, so I've had to describe this quite recently to athletes. So probiotics are kind of a live bacteria. And when we take a probiotic, then that colonizes in our own, own gut to help what the bacteria that's there. But the point to remember is it's kind of artificial bacteria. So if we use kind of, say, the war that's going on in Ukraine and Russia at the moment. So if you think of probiotics, that would be soldiers coming from another country to help fight the Ukrainian army. They, they will help, they will, they will you know, defeat the bad bacteria. And then after the war, if, if we stop taking the probiotic, they will, they will go. Whereas a prebiotic helps the bacteria that's already in our gut to work to be stronger. So it's almost like people sending tanks and munitions to support the army that's, that's already there. And we get prebiotic foods from 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 plants basically so onions apples bananas leeks oats they're really good sources of, of prebiotic foods so good to be including in the diet and then probiotics we tend to get from um 
we can get from a lot of fermented foods um, we can get from live yogurts um, obviously capsule probiotics um, and things like that a lot of things like kimchi and kefir that claim to be contain probiotics it's quite hard to quantify how much probiotics they, they contain so the best thing to be doing is to just be eating a range of different different plants um, different fruits vegetables and they will kind of help to nourish the body's own good bacteria to summarize perfect james anything from your side to add no i think just just to add on that is the reason why it might be important to, to be really looking after our gut as well as you talk about training it is for those pathways of absorption to work really effectively that might be why it's so important so to have a good variety of, of bacteria in the gut to have it healthy and, and, and very full if you like and um, could potentially help with the absorption of those carbohydrates during exercise as well and make it more efficient so that's why it might be of interest for the, the athletes who have joined us today is just to improve that that process in the gut as well nice. yeah and there's, there's, there's things that can kind of almost be harmful to our gut bacteria so if we have really high protein intakes that that long term that might be harmful to our gut bacteria um things like artificial sweeteners that we get in kind of chewing gum and protein bars like uh, zorbitol and uh, xylitol if we're having lots of those foods they can actually be harmful to our our gut bacteria but vegetables and and fruits they're they're the kind of good guys so more of them and nice. less of the others cool it's, it's so interesting always how generally fruit and veg um there's always just if you're ever in doubt that's what to go for um another sort of area which was of interest uh you were, i think the stories that you've shared have been fascinating at this and um listening to the kevin sinfield diet a few people were kind of like well maybe you know ultra endurance is the way for me just to eat anything that i want and that sounds amazing <laughs> but uh, you mentioned about crisps and pretzels and things like that obviously to increase the salt intake so i just wondered if again i'll throw it out there um you could explain a little bit about the importance of salt what it does and how that helps with kind of muscle cramping and making sure everything's in balance so if i maybe start with you james hudson but i don't know feel free to argue between um yeah, I think um, so. Sodium is what we might term as an electrolyte, which is in, in normal salt, but it's also in some of the sports drinks and things that we'll get as well. And the idea is that it tries to retain the fluid that we drink. So by containing sodium, the movement of water into through the gut, into the, into the bloodstream and into muscles to keep them hydrated while they're working will be more effective is, is the idea because obviously when we're training and we're doing especially with endurance exercise we're going to be sweating a lot and losing some of those electrolytes at the same time so to maintain that that sodium balance if you like to help with our fluid balance that's why we might include sports drinks which have sodium in them the gels and things like that but also from foods which contain a little bit of salt as well along the way so that's why we want to try and maintain those that electrolyte balance and um, in terms of cramp there's a lot of things that can can, move, can can really affect and bring about cramp. And if we're honest, no one really knows what the answer is. It's a culmination of lots of different things. So hydration is, is, is one of the key pillars around trying to prevent cramp, making sure that you are including some of those electrolytes to maintain your fluid balance. That might also be helpful when you're doing your long runs or long bikes is just to have a quick look at how much fluid you're losing. So hop on the scales beforehand and hop on afterwards and you can have a quick look at the difference. Each We talked about this a little bit before on the endurance events. Each kilo of body weight lost equates to about a litre to a litre and a half of fluid. So that will also give you a guideline as to whether you're getting enough fluid in whilst you're out on, on a longer training session or an event. Um, but it also is, for me, it's all about fueling. People people tend to get cramp, in my opinion, when they are under fueling while they're doing a long a long event. They've got to build capacity by training, but you've got to fuel that training to help your muscles build that capacity so you can cope with the longer events. Now, we still see it occasionally in, in, in players, in rugby players that I work with closely, and that's usually when they've come back from injury and they maybe haven't quite got the volume of work in as they return back to training. In endurance athletes, it tends to be where they just haven't quite got the volume of work done. But to do that, you need to fuel it in those sessions. So, James, I don't know whether you still see riders when they get back from pre-season, when they start to have issues and how you resolve those. Yeah, I've seen it on the race I was just on with, with guys having had COVID early season and then the flu. And then they've kind of come into a hard race and they've not had 
the consistency of training. And we had a stage where it was 10 degrees, pretty cold, and the rider had cramp in a real specific part of his quad. And he was like, oh, it's electrolytes, I need this. I was like, well, you've drank enough, you've, you've fueled enough, you're just not fit enough, you, is, the, is the bottom line. And quite often it's athletes have just pushed harder than what their capabilities are. Um, so pushing too hard too too early in a in a training phase or you know running above their pace on a on a race day or competition day you know the neuromuscular fatigue is what what causes the cramp fueling and hydration can make that worse but they're not really the the main cause that is really good yeah. to know that's humbling as well i did a um marathon a few weeks ago and i'll be honest i wasn't prepared and about 22 miles in i was like you know when you get the twinge of cramp like it's coming and I was like, I just need to do it and drink. And it just wouldn't go. And it was just because I was grossly underprepared. So I think that's a good realisation for sure. Yeah. But I just think, I think it just comes back to this element that hopefully we've hammered away today. It's, it's about planning. It's about following a, a training schedule for those last 10 to 12 weeks into an event that progressively builds the load into your muscles. And then it's about supporting that with the right fuel to do it. Because then you'll have confidence going into an event. You don't want to have... To go into an event, like you say, go into a marathon having not really run past that sort of 17, 18 mile mark and not really tested out those those fueling choices. So you know exactly what flavor, what textures, what what foods you're going to include, or how you're going to go about it, when during the race you're going to have those time spots. It's, it's all about preparation and just minimizing any error that you don't control. <laughs> then, yeah. then you're going to be successful. I, I but, always think that's a great point in that you can't wing an, an endurance event like you can't rely on having a good day because you'll get found out um i want to chuck in one final super quick question if that's okay james you just mentioned planning one final question that's come up quite a lot is about kind of frequency and volume of eating so you mentioned earlier about how um kind of like people often underfuel during their training and therefore overeat after so they can still get into that surplus but thinking about before the event kind of how do you approach that so carb loading um is it a thing how long should you do it for um that's a broad question so if i pass to james and Rand to hopefully give a more succinct answer that'd be amazing yeah yeah i think yeah we've we've focused a lot on the pre-race or pre-event and during but really the the carbohydrate loading is done in that 24 hour period before <clears throat> that's that's the key the, then the pre-race meal doesn't need to be massive because you've done all the hard work the day before what most people will do will not eat enough the day before or drink enough and then they will panic eat and drink at breakfast and that that's when we see underperformance and or a bad stomach so just thinking that 24 hours before about just increasing carbohydrates with each meal trying to pick plain types of carbohydrate white rice white pasta and not having too much vegetables um, and reducing things like red meat and anything spicy or fatty in that 24 hours before is the the key to not having bad guts and being well fueled perfect i think that's great i think um if you can have a light race so you feel right 24 hours before you don't need to go crazy in the morning i'm just gonna have a bowl of rice krispies and according to you two <laughs> I'm going to do it away. That's been great. If you've, um, changed, honestly, if you've there's, Yeah, that's the bit I need to work out next. Um, you've both shared so much. Honestly, thank you for all of the advice. I think no matter if you like endurance sport or not, like the stories it are fascinating. And I think it's been it's been great. So thank you both for your time. And uh, we'd love to work with you more again in the future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. So thanks, James, for joining me. That was brilliant insight. Yeah. Thank yes. you, James. Um, for everyone watching as well, hopefully you've enjoyed the event as much as we have. Um, please do again check out the handout section for all of our events in May. Um, Mental Health Awareness Week is a big one for everyone, so please do share that. And you'll also be greeted by a feedback form on your way out. So it, we'd love to hear what you thought of this session. We're always looking to improve um, and hopefully, again, you enjoyed as much as we did. So until next time, um, take care, enjoy your afternoons and uh, we'll see you again very soon. <laughs>